I'm going to talk about clutches. So, this is a pressure plate, right? It's big, it's heavy, it's repairable. You can take it apart. It's got these screws up up here at the at the uh, at the at the top. It's got these screws. You can take it apart. Um, you can you can get it all nice and clean. You can resurface this this area here. Um, you can resurface the the thrust. You can put it all back to, together. You can let me get rid of all this other junk on my screen here. Oh, what did I just do? Come on. The Zoom session from hell. <laughs> You're still with us, though. <laughs> so anyway, then then you've got springs inside the pressure plate that are that are colored, and depending on their color, it's it's how much clamping force this thing has. So it's just there are just three levers. You can see the three levers on here, kind of. And when you when you push on this, the levers move. And this plate back here, this big plate, um, pulls back. And it pulls back just a fraction of an inch. I mean, like a 64th of an inch or something. Not very much at all. The clamping force on this is enormous. When I put one of these on the floor and, and, and balance myself on the thrust plate and stand on it, I can't throw it out. I weigh two and a quarter. If I jump on it, then yes, I can get it to throw out, but not very easily. Anyway, these these pressure plates are used up through the to the end of the MGA. Um, I'm not sure where they stop and start on the midget, um, but they're they're um, they're heavy duty. They can be rebuilt. They're often rebuilt, and uh, um, you don't really need to change them unless the springs have failed or something, but they're very heavy. So the next one in line, with the introduction of the MGB, is the diaphragm clutch. So this has got all these figures. It's not rebuildable, not at home. I mean, everything is rebuildable, right? And somebody will say, well, I rebuilt one once, but I, I would never try to do it. Um, so it, and it's got the same, same uh, thrust plate on the backside. If you take a straight edge and put it across the, uh, the the part that clamps up against the flywheel, you can see that there's some distance here um, between the the what would be the flywheel and this thrust plate or the the clamping the clamping plate for the for the clutch, and that's where the clutch goes. We had a rash of them about, oh, I don't know, 20 years ago that were made wrong in, the, in that plate sat too far away from the flywheel. So even though we put in a brand new clutch, it immediately slipped. So the clutch disc looks like this. It's not blue. They're, they're never supplied blue. I painted, the, I painted this. Um, this is one of the ones that's right down to the rivets. You can see these. Are, um, this is the back side of a rivet, but the front side of the rivet is is here. You can just barely, barely see it there. And um, if the clutch gets too thin, it gets too thin, then the the clamping the clamping of the pressure plate isn't enough, and this will freewheel between the five wheel and the pressure plate resulting in a slipping clutch. There's springs, there's springs on the clutch because the center here, where my little tiny finger is taken out here, this is distinct from the outer rim. Okay, this is, this is, held, this is held in place by the spring. So when you let your foot off the clutch, the, cent the center can move just a little bit in relation to the outside, which makes engaging the clutch smoother. There aren't springs on a Mini or an MG1100 or something. Uh, these springs will get real weak, they get 
beat up and the clutch can get very, very chattery. Let me pull out another clutch disc here. So I have several. Here's a clutch disc that looks pretty good. I don't know why it's in here. This has only got 10 splines down, down the middle. Uh, 10 splines, that would be for uh, uh, an MGA, earlier MGA, 61 and back. These springs are a little loose. Um, I can I can turn these I can turn these springs. You can see me turning these uh, that spring. So and these springs have got a, a color on them too. These are these are um, uh, green, which again has to do with how much how much uh, play there is in the in the clutch. And then I don't know whether you can see this or not, but right up here. That's, you can see that the outside and the inside are connected only with these little tiny strips of metal. So no matter how much power your engine has, it's connected to the gearbox and to the back of the car only through these little tiny, tiny blades of metal. And those blades hardly ever fail. I have some examples of ones that have failed, of course. Here's one, this failed pretty badly. So this is all, all that's left, but look at this. This is the only thing that connects the, uh, the outside, which is completely gone on this happy boy. Um, but this is the only thing that, that connects the clutch disc to the center. It's amazing how much energy you can pass through there and not have a problem. Clutch lining. This might be from that same clutch. Uh, the clutch lining is uh, is very much like brake lining. Used to be asbestos. I don't know what they're made of now. And here's a here's a clutch that came apart. Uh, you can see this this part up here um, used to fit used to fit down in, inside of here. They just broke up. So with that clamping force being so dramatic, and, and it's it's really I mean hundreds of pounds of pressure. Now all you need is the tiniest little piece of stuff in there because it doesn't move much when it separates. All you need is the tiniest piece of stuff in there, and it'll continue to allow the, the clutch disc to rotate. Here's a smaller clutch. This is uh, from a midget 1500, in fact. This has only got four springs on it. And um, they say on them, you probably can't see this because my light isn't good enough, but it says up here, flywheel side. So you can see that that's the, the side which has got more, more, um, now this, this one looks about the same, but the earlier, the earlier flushes, there's a pretty flat side to it back here. You can see there's not much there, but there's quite a lot on, on this side. And if you get the clutch disc in backwards when you change the clutch, you cannot get it to throw out. You cannot get it disengaged. So the, the, um, the clutch disc down on the inside is good on an MGB that's driven normally, is good for about 50,000 miles. Uh, some, of them, some of them you get a lot more. Chances are uh, Bob and Gloria got a lot of miles on, on their clutch. Uh, and then you can take a brand new clutch and all you gotta do is slip it. We had a customer whose uh, wife took the car away and sat in traffic for 20 minutes with her, with her foot depressed with a midget and the clutch didn't work anymore. So brand new, <laughs> brand new clutch with 20 miles on it. So you can you can ruin a brand new clutch immediately, and you can you can make a clutch last forever. The secret is when you're driving the car, just keep your foot off the clutch. Start it in neutral, idle it in neutral, stop lights, stop signs, stop start traffic, knock it in neutral, and take your foot off the clutch. Modern cars, you're riding lawnmower. There's all, the, all these safety devices in there that you've got to have the clutch pedal depressed 
to make the to to get the car to start and all that kind of stuff, safety stuff. But um, it's in our, on our cars. Of course, everyone's tried to start the car with the clutch with the clutch released uh, by accident at least once. The car hops real fast. Um, but the proper way to do it, of course, is in neutral with your foot off the clutch. Start it that way, idle it that way, stop light, stop sign, stop start traffic. Keep your foot off the clutch. So when you move the clutch pedal six inches, there's about a seven to one ratio, I think something like that on the pedal. And then there's a ratio, I, I was going to calculate it out, but the master cylinder bore is three quarters and the slave cylinder bore is one and an eighth inches. So there's probably four to five to one ratio there. And then there's another uh, ratio that you get with the release bearing fork, um, maybe one and a half or the most maybe two to one, because when you move the clutch pedal that far, the slave cylinder moves only about three eighths of an inch just a tiny, tiny little bit. And that in turn moves, moves the, the, the thrust plate on the pressure plate even less. And that's why the MG clutch is so nice, so soft most of the time, so soft and it doesn't take a lot of effort to depress that pedal and, and get the clutch to disengage. So if, if you're driving down the road and you're in third gear and you're doing 45 miles an hour, you put your pedal to the metal, you know, you want to accelerate real fast. And all of a sudden you notice something's odd in the engine. The engine's revving up, but the car isn't going any faster. That's textbook case slipping clutch. So that, though, that happens. That just happens. That's normal use. It's like when brake pads start to go bad. I mean, it's just, it's just wear. Proper, proper use of the clutch can extend the life, but over a period of time, the cut clutch finally fails. And to repair the clutch, you've got to take the engine and gearbox, at least the engine, out of the car. In the case of a midget, the engine and gearbox. Um, take it out of the car. In the case of a T-type, at least you got to take the gearbox out from the inside. Um, uh, TR6s are nice because you can get the gearboxes out from inside. Um, but you got to take the basically you got to take the engine out. It's a huge, huge task. Whenever you replace the clutch, whenever you replace the clutch, you must rebuild the hydraulics at the same time. So as long as you always have to replace the hydraulics when you do the clutch, you replace the hydraulics first and just see if maybe that takes care of the problem you've got. If the, fa if the failure that you have is a failure to disengage, you press on the pedal and you can't get it into reverse, <laughs> the teeth are grinding against each other. It's like, whoa, or your release point is like right off the floor. I mean, it's just like right off the floor. It's like, geez, it used to, used to throw out better than, than that. Normally on an MGB clutch, um, when you when you've got the pedal depressed about two thirds of the way, it's it's uh, it's starting to disengage or the disengagement is almost always there, and then throughout its life, the disengagement point keeps getting higher and higher and higher and higher on that pedal until you barely have to touch the pedal at all to get it to throw out, and finally, of course, you don't have to touch the pedal at all, and it's and it's slipping. It's, it's uh, disengaged. So if you wait, if a clutch is hot and it's worn out, you can't go anywhere. I mean, you, you're stuck in an intersection. You let your foot off the clutch, car doesn't go anywhere. I mean, it just, it's slipping. But if you can wait, if you can wait for it to cool down, you, you're able to move the car, maybe back home. I had a call from a woman one time. She said, oh, my son's got my MG in Michigan State University. And he says, he, you know, lets the clutch pedal out and it doesn't go anywhere. And I said, well, just, just tell him to get it over to the side of the road, just calm down and just wait, you know, wait 20 minutes, wait for it to cool down a little bit, and then he'll be able to drive it. But they were in too much of a yank and got the tow truck and had it brought, brought back. I thought maybe he could, he could ease it back to Grand Rapids if he didn't make it slip. 
just be cheaper than a tow truck, but not that type for them. So the bigger, the bigger issues often are a failure to disengage. So let's take a look at some of those pieces. This is a T-type, apologize for, for my camera here. This is a, a T-type arrangement. You've got a great big shaft here that goes uh, into the um, into the frame of the car. Then this is the brake pedal uh, here that free wheels around it, but then you got the clutch pedal. And when you press the clutch pedal, it moves this rod and that rod on the end of the rod, this goes into an, another fitting, which pivots on the sump, on the end of, of the engine. So on a T-type, when you depress the clutch, you're Pull, you're pulling on the engine. The engine's getting pulled towards you. So you step on the pedal, the engine's getting pulled towards you. And sometimes it can make clutch disengagement um, or re-engagement when you're letting the pedal out and you want to take off nice and smooth, like you can drive a, a stick. Um, but sometimes it's right, 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 because the engine itself is moving. So on all T-types, every now and then, just, just, with a car turned off, look at the gear lever, get a real good look at the gear lever. Car doesn't have to be running. Just look at the gear lever down at your side and depress the, the clutch pedal. That gear lever should not move at all. None, zero. There's a saddle mount, well, a real crummy saddle mount at the, at the uh, right underneath the gearbox that prohibits the gearbox from moving rearwards when you press on the pedal. But sometimes that mount fails. And when that happens, then you're letting off on the clutch. Um, the, en the engine starts to move because the engine moves, the, the solid connection between the throttle pedal and the carburetors, that moves, that increases or decreases your RPM. And you can get a especially in reverse, um, which is just almost uncontrollable. Um, Sometimes those springs have gone bad in the clutch disc also. But it's um, if you get everything all sorted out and you get the, the engine fixed in position, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, happen much. So on an MGB, This is, this is why I don't like roller release bearings. This thing's all plastic. It just, it just wasn't up for, for the job. It's, it's one of my, it's my, I'm not keen on roller release bearings, but this thing just, this it was de left depressed for too long and it melted. Anyway, here's the, uh, here's the fork. Here's the fork on an MGB. So you can see the distance from the pivot point out to where it catches the slave cylinder is a little bit longer. I don't know how to measure it. A little bit longer than the point from which it pivots out to where the, the uh, release bearing sits inside the fork. Um, so the, there are three parts of the clutch hydraulics on an MGB. Well, really four, but one of them doesn't go bad. So you've got the master cylinder. You got a steel line that goes from the master cylinder down to the flex hose. It's that steel line that doesn't fail. It does on a midget because it sits in front of the battery. The battery acid eats through it. Doesn't happen. That doesn't happen on a B. And um, then you got the flex hose, and then you got the slave cylinder. So if the slave cylinder leaks, it's faulty. If the slave cylinder is faulty, it leaks. So if it's not leaking, it's not faulty. That's easy. The slave hose can collapse on the inside. The inside di diameter can collapse. So with pressure from your foot, you can push fluid through the hose. But when you take your foot off, now you're relying on the, on the uh, pressure from the pressure plate to push the 
uh, push the fluid back out and it's under restriction. So you let your foot off the clutch and it kind of feels like an automatic. It's, ew. It isn't like snappy. You can't bite the wheels. And it's often accompanied by a swishing noise is that fluid's trying to get through a real tiny orifice inside that flexible hose. The master cylinder is, is um, if it leaks externally, it's faulty, but it can leak internally. So there's no loss of fluid, it just doesn't move, it just doesn't make any pressure. And so you can't throw the clutch out. So when you're doing clutch hydraulics, you either repair or replace the master cylinder. I would encourage you to repair it because it's easier, okay? Now, water gets into the, into the master cylinder. It, it corrodes the bottom of the master cylinder bore. And if it's corroded, then a new seal is only gonna last for so long and that's gonna fail again too. But um, it's so much easier to rebuild it. All you need is a pair of a screwdriver and a um, pair of needle nose pliers and a set of 90 degree snap ring pliers and a little hook to pull the guts out of the master cylinder. You can get it all apart in place in place, put the new seals on, you don't hone it or anything, just put it back to, together. Changing the hose and the slave, you usually do that at the same time. That's a real bugger. It's easier if the starter motor's out. Um, if you got a crow foot wrench, 7 16 crow foot, you can, you can get the line loose, the steel line from the, from the slave hose, and then use an inch socket to get the huge giant nut off the top of the of the slave hose. Once that's all loose, then you can take the slave off the side of the gearbox and, re and replace the, the slave. New slaves are assembled uh, for packaging. So the bleeder is almost always pointed straight ahead. Sometimes I, we used to get those in where somebody screwed the hose into the bleeder hole and put the bleeder in, in the hose hole. You can't get all the air out of the, out of the slave. Bleeding it, bleeding it is, is um, I, I repeat this a lot, repeat it here. Um, we, if, when you've done hydraulics, you've rebuilt the master and changed the slave and the slave hose, and you're all set to bleed it again. You gotta get the air out. So the first five bleeds, you don't even use the bleeder. You just use your finger. So you're underneath there and you got your finger on the, on the slave cylinder instead of the bleeder in the hole take your finger off and you're hollering out the commands to the person up in the, up in the driver's seat who's depressing the clutch pedal, not the brake pedal. It's always embarrassing when you don't get anything for, for three or four minutes and then you find out the guy's pressing the brake pedal instead. Um, anyway, finger off, depress the pedal. Now you tell this person up there who's sitting in the driver's seat depressing it. It can be an eight-year-old kid. I mean, it doesn't make a difference who it is, but this is not an emergency stop. I mean, you don't have to jump on that pedal like, um, like you're trying to win some award, just to press it down to, to the floor because eventually there's going to be quite a burst of fluid that comes out of there and getting that stuff in your face is just nasty. And what's the point? Finger off, pedal down, finger on, pedal up, and then you count out 20 seconds. This is, this is the trick. Count out 20 seconds. Finger off, pedal down, finger on, pedal up, count out 20 seconds. During that 20 seconds, the vacuum in the master cylinder bore will draw fluid from the reservoir into the master cylinder bore. After 20 seconds, it's stabilized. Finger off, pedal down, finger on, pedal up, count out 20 seconds. After you've done that five times, you'll get a great big blurp of fluid that comes out when your finger's off. Finger off, pedal down, out comes the fluid. At that point, don't use, do, don't use your finger again. Just put, put, the, put the bleeder in there, get it tight, finger, you know, um, bleeder tight, pedal up, and then go up and pour more fluid in the master cylinder. If you buy one of the new master cylinders, it's almost a three-person job to bleed the clutch because the, the amount of fluid in the reservoir is so tiny that you can bleed it dry. That's embarrassing. You get you go, yeah, we got it. Oh, whoops. The master cylinder is drying, so you're pushing air back through the system again. 
if you're using silicone fluid, some people want to use silicone fluid because silicone fluid does not eat paint. That is its only attribute. It's got a lot of disadvantages. One is that you've got to bleed it really slowly because the, the any air in there will aerate, make a billion little bubbles, and you've got to wait hours till the next day for those bubbles to coalesce into bigger bubbles and, and uh, so you can expel them. So be very cautious when you're when you're using silicone brake fluid. Also on an MGA or any tan, a dual master cylinder like an MGA or early Sprite, um, you've got to be really really careful and allow the the master cylinder pistons to come farther forward in the master cylinder than they would naturally by adding a spacer out in front underneath the front cover. If you want to know about that, I, I, it takes me a while to explain it. But you got to let the master cylinder pistons move a little tiny more forward than they would be originally because the silicone fluid causes the primary seal to swell and it covers up a little tiny, tiny bleed hole inside the master cylinder and fluid cannot get from the reservoir into the master cylinder bore. So by allowing that piston to come forward just another J 16th of an inch, you're all done. It's all taken care of. It all works. It's great. Uh, you can either take the piston and chuck it up in the lathe and skim 16th of an inch off it or more easily just take a, a 16th inch piece of cardboard, make a new gasket on the front, large enough for those pistons to come through um, and uh, uh, just Call it, a, uh, call it a, a day there. So the, the other problems with a clutch is you get a juttery clutch. You know, you're trying to back up, you're trying to be cool and show, show somebody that you, you've owned this car for 13 years and you know how to back up, but it's just rant, 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 rant. It's just awful. And almost always that is from the, um, the springs being bad in the clutch itself. And there, there's, no, there's no hope until you take the engine out and replace the replace the clutch. Let me see if there's anything else going on here. You can rebuild a master cylinder in place. You don't have to even take it off the hose. Um, if it's if it's weeping, if it's weeping, you can go to Napa and buy a Lockheed a Lockheed. Uh, in, I think it's inch and an eighth cup and just pop the thing apart in in place. Maybe maybe take it loose from from the gearbox. You can even put a hone in there, a dingleberry brush, and, uh, and hone the inside of it. Some of those slaves can get really, really crusty. There's no such thing as adjusting the clutch. You can on a TR, but you cannot on, a, on an MGA or an MGB or a midget, midget 1500. T-types you can, the TR, some of the TRs you can, but the, the MG you don't. It's just like um, they're self-adjusting, like, like uh, uh, brake calipers are on the front front of the car. Those are those are self-adjusting. So I think that's about what I wanted to talk about on clutches. So so I'm I'm interested to know if anyone's had any clutch problems or a snag or run into a problem that I didn't cover here. You want to say something about? Hey John, can you talk a little bit more about throw out bearings? Well, let me talk about this. <laughs> yeah, you talked about that one, but okay. So, um, on a Triumph, yeah, on a Triumph, you've got a you, you've got a, a a pressure plate which is turning. You got the thrust face, and you've got a a, a a roller bearing, which is on a sleeve and approaches it and just presses it. Okay, it's just it's straight line motion. Straight line motion works great, but if you've got a if you've got a, a ball bearing clutch with a race that moves, and you're trying to line here's here's the here's the circle for the for the thrust, and here's the circle from the the uh, um, release bearing the throw bearing. It has for it to work correctly. It's got to be straight on, but it can't be straight on because this pivots. This pivots. 
So, so this this line, this this line up here that's holding the throat bearing, um, is um, get this off, off, off to the side. It 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 moves, and so the so the thrust plate and the and the bearing are no longer straight; they're offset. So, in maybe two spots, it's not slipping, but on the on the others, it, I guess it has to be slipping it everywhere. Um, it's still slipping. So I, I, my experience with, with roller bearings, I, I, I like, the, I like the carbon thrust. I like the carbon thrust. That said, maybe five years ago, eight years ago, all of a sudden we got a bunch of them that were made, probably in our favorite country, and they failed. They failed within two minutes, two miles, twenty miles, two hundred miles. I had a guy from the shop call me; he's almost in tears. He's, he put a, put a clutch all in the in a midget, tested it, tested it, tested it. It's great. His customer picks it up, calls him five minutes later. The, the throw bearing had crumbled. It's just oh, it's, it's so frustrating. So at that point, I said, well, you know, a roller a roller bearing doesn't fail like that. Um, so roller bearings are better. But I'm I'm I think the the quality of the graphite bearings, and it's just like an 8H pencil. You can take a throat bearing from a T-type and you can write your name on a cardboard box with it. It's just graphite. Um, those work out pretty well. So what do you got to add, Jack? Fred? <laughs> John, I got a 57 MGA. Yeah. Which, which has the problem you just described in reverse with the chattery clutch. Yeah. Is it worth it to put the original clutch back in it or put the MGB clutch in it? If you want to put an MGB clutch in an MGA, you need an MGB flywheel, which is lighter, weighs about 18 pounds versus the 27 pounds for an MGA. That's nice. You've got to find one. And then you've got to change the front cover on the MGA gearbox. And then of course you've got to change the, the fork. Uh, here's, uh, here's an MGA fork on top and here's the B, B fork on the bottom. You can see that they're, they're different widths. Um, yeah. Okay, and, and the, the, the annulus um, made, made by both bearings, the MGB one is, is not, Twice as, as large as the A, but almost. And you can use that lighter weight clutch. You can also buy a competition clutch, which I've had in my MGA since I rebuilt it in 1980, and it's still working fine. I've had I've had the engine out, I've changed the clutch disc, but I haven't changed the, the, the pressure plate. But you've got to find those three pieces. You gotta okay. find three pieces. So uh, the the master, the slave, all that stuff is all the same exactly. Okay, I'll probably just then stay with the original pressure plate and whatever. Just call, call out to call out to uh, Ian or Paul at Sports Car Craftsman and okay. just see if they've got it or or um, Bob and Gloria have their their um, uh, try not try and rescue. Um, like, why can't I work? Because it's got a try. What's what's the name of that place, Bob? Team, Team Triumph. Team Triumph. I can never remember it because it's got Triumph in the name. Uh, Team Triumph <laughs> in, in Ohio. So there's there's some used parts places around it. You know, you just check and see. You know. Oh yeah, no, I, I can get the parts. Probably no problem from Ben out of British Auto Selby's here in Rochester. So okay, uh, and that's probably that's, well, you gotta, and, and on the that's a three main. That's a three main flywheel. Right, yeah, three main flywheel. Three main flywheel. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, that's all. That's it. Thank you. Great. Okay. Hey, John. Gary Greenspoon of Victoria. Yeah, Gary. How are you doing? Great. So I was under the impression that when you were changing your clutch, you wanted to change your master cylinder, your slave cylinder, and your hoses. But you're saying you can keep your slave? You can rebuild the master and the slave. You can do that. But if the slave isn't leaking, can you just reuse the slave? Or you? Oh, you could, but... It, it's it's then you're going to end up having to change it a month from now because the the pressure to throw out the the um, with a new pressure plate it's it's usually it's usually stronger than the old one and and uh, um, it'll it'll just it'll develop a leak 
So it is just the, the rule is the rule was in my shop. Whenever we did a clutch, we always did the hydraulics. You didn't try to save any money because it just meant the customer was going to be someplace and it was going to fail on him. And he calls up and says, I just spent $1,200 on a clutch and my clutch has gone bad again. And, and, um, you know, well, we tried to save you 150 bucks and he says, why, you know, I'm stuck now. So we, we just always did those, always did those, but uh, okay, thank you. a rebuilt one's just fine too, you know? So, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, John. Yeah. Did you ever hear about the uh, trick of soaking the carbon throw a bearing in oil overnight before putting it in? You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. It, well, they, they say that it's uh, it will impregnate the carbon with a little bit of oil. I've heard it called the racer's edge, but I don't know if it makes any difference. I've always done it. I never had a problem with it, but I okay. don't know if you ever heard of that. You know, I've had people mention it to me and all I can think of is it would, it would cause the carbon to, to crumble or break away or something. I mean, that's, you know, that was always my thought because you, or someone got confused because there's a spigot bushing, the spigot bushing, you're supposed to, to soak that in oil, you know, on the back of the crank when you, when you change that. And I just thought, well, why, why would that? That's, that's a centered bushing. So. Um, I think there's supposed to be oil on the, um, on the carbon face. I mean, I've got a couple of them showing here. Uh, I was lucky because I changed mine out right after the horrible stories of the failing throw-out bearings, and I guess they had gotten rid of them all. These came from the major uh, supplier that we all use, and I've had it in for about four years now, driven the crap out of it, and it's doing fine. So uh, hopefully they got rid of that problem. But carbon, the whole point of carbon is that it is the lubricant. Yeah. Yeah. So I have heard of that, but I've I've never passed it on because it just something it doesn't sit well with me. But you've but you've done that. You you've yeah. done that on yours. Okay, all right. So it doesn't hurt anything apparently. Okay. Um, there are other other friction points. There's a bolt that goes through the through the release bearing. There's no uh, uh, there's no uh, bushing here. These can get worn pretty badly. I happen to have an example here. Well, that's another thing. I'll always replace that bolt and bushing. So here's the here's the elongated elongated hole. I don't know if you can tell it's elongated, but it sure is. And here's the bolt, which shows a little bit of wear. <laughs> oh, jeez, this thing's really beat up, you know. So yeah, you yeah, always change that. Always change that bolt and bushing. And for those those of you who are going to go take a, a test on parts, this is the washer. This is the washer that goes underneath the nylock nut for the for the um, um, for the bolt, and then the nylock goes on on top of this. That is the same washer as a head washer. It's the same part. So there, there are twelve head washers in an MGA or. It, MGB, but one of them's not used on the head, one of them's used here. Here's here's that same fork with a bushing in it. And and as Fred said, this is a centered, a centered bushing, um, which is a uh, which means that it's it's uh it's not turned out of a piece of brass, it's made out of brass dust, brass dust and oil, and they crush it together. And form something it's brittle. Um, it'll crumble if, if you hit it with a hammer. It doesn't bend. It crumbles, and and it, it holds all that oil inside there. It's centered bushing. Good evening, John. This is Barney. Hey, Barney. Yeah, I got a whole bunch of information on clutches. Uh, particularly, I'd like to start with that carbon release bearing. Yep. I've had uh, good luck with those for decades, half a million miles. And last summer, I did an engine overhaul, replaced the clutch with all new parts. And about four months later, the release bearing failed. Yep. So there's the bad ones are still out there. Okay. Oh, you're, you're muted again, Barney. You're muted. You're muted. 
Hi there. <laughs> yeah, I, I found out if I change windows, holding a space bar down doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so it's a power tune bushing. It comes in a blue box. Moss is selling the things as the uh, cheaper discounted. Lost you again. Yeah. Moss sells them as the less expensive part, uh, and it's in a power tune box. And we've had reports of power tune carbon bearings failing at least five years ago, maybe longer, long time now. Uh, and they're always power tuned once we figured out who was making the things. And they come in MGAs and MGBs. I have an MGB clutch in my car, so I've got an MGB release bearing in the thing. I put all brand new parts in it last August, and in December, the clutch failed. Failed miserably. All the carbon just crumbled and disappeared out of the thing. And when it did that, it chewed up a lot of stuff. It chewed up the release plate on the, on the clutch cover. It chewed up the throw at arm. Uh, it bent or broke part of the aluminum cover on the front of the transmission, just destroyed everything that was in there. I had kind of anticipated that it may have damaged the transmission front cover. So I quick ordered one of those for next day air delivery. So it came by the time the other parts came and sure enough, when I took it apart, the aluminum cover was damaged as well. So there's a lot of damage when that, you know, $10 bushing fa bearing fails, you know, it would cause a thousand dollars worth of damage if you're paying some shop to do that. So by all means, avoid the power tune bearings. They're bad, bad, bad carbon power tune bearings. They've been bad for years and they're still bad. If I could figure out how to do screen sharing, I could show you pictures of some of this stuff. Next time. Next time. Okay. Uh, aside from that, I've had very good uh, luck with the carbon bearings. And when people said they had carbon bearings failing, I had no problem with them at all <clears throat> until this last one that I put in that was a power tune bearing. Okay. I, I have all kinds of information on the mechanics of a clutch too. All the ratios and pressures in an MGA or an MGB, the pressure plate force against the flywheel is 1200 pounds. Uh, okay. And when, you, when, when you push the pedal down, it goes down about five inches. You got about 20, 25 or 30 pounds of pedal force. And through all these gear, uh, you know, mechanical reduction ratios, 25 pounds of force on the pedal gives you 1,200 pound retraction on the clutch pressure plate. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, I know it's like uh, throughout all that mechanical advantage. The, the I know the pedal seven to one, and the the, the master to the slave has got to be four or five to one, and the in the arm in the arm, and then within the pressure plate itself. So yeah. Because you're moving at what five inches, six inches, and in the end, the the, the pressure plate's only moving, you know, just a just a sixteenth less, probably less than a sixteenth of an inch in it. So yeah, the overall ratio between your pedal and the clutch disc and the clutch pressure plate motion is forty eight to one mechanical advantage. Okay. If you move the thing four inches at the pedal, you're going to get like one twelfth of an inch at the pressure plate. Okay. Interesting. I know we struggled. We struggled with that with that bad pressure plate that we had, and we got, of course, we got two or three of them right in a row because we kept ordering ordering from the same supplier, and they were coming out of the same lot. But the uh, that the uh, the clamping ring was sitting too far below the surface where it mounted up against the, the flywheel. It was so, I mean, you know, when you're in a shop and you do a job, with luck you get paid for it, but you hardly ever get paid twice. And well, I think we did this guy's clutch three or four times. <laughs> so, until we figured out what was going on, you know, then got a, a different pressure plate, so. Hey, John. When, you, when you put an MGB pressure plate into an MGA, with the MGA 1600s, the B pressure plate can rub the inside of the housing fairly near the starter motor. It's just a little bit, but it's enough to make it seize up. So you end up having to grind a little bit out of the inside of the bell housing for clearance. And then we had 
the replacement B pressure plates maybe four or five years ago that came with a different physical design on the outside and there's no way those were even going to fit into the bell housing. Okay. In, into an MGA housing. Yes, I suppose they probably would fit into an MGB housing. It must be bigger, the later models especially. But when you're going for the uh, three main bearing engines and the small bell housings, yeah. then the later model B pressure plate is not going to go in there. So the well, one we have to replace. This is the old uh, Borg, Borg and Beck style, and it's it's a pretty pretty uh, slim slim profile. Um, but the oh Lockheed ones, what what were those? And they were they were they were bell shaped. I mean, they were they were they were huge. They were huge, and I I I, I didn't have a I never had a problem fitting that. We didn't get very many B clutches onto A's. Um, but I remember one that, that, that I had, it, it jammed up, just like you said, that was real frustrating. The, the one you were just holding up, you've got the nice slim profile with the rounded corners on it, rounded shoulders, yeah. but where the square ears stick out on the corners, on the edges, the, the fairly recent replacements that did not fit, those square ears on the sides were huge. Okay. Okay. Very easy to spot if you've seen them once before. You can tell them from a mile away which ones are not going to fit. Well, if you if you've never seen one before, all you can do is match it up with your old one. But just that's the line. Be aware before <laughs> before you put the whole thing back together. Make sure you can turn the engine 360 degrees without it snagging on the on the inside of the inside of the gearbox. Yep. Yeah, that means you have to mate the engines of the transmission before you put it in the car. If you want to put them in separately, put it together, spin it around, try it out, then take it apart and put it in the car. Okay. Okay. So, Peter, you've been trying to get on here for, for a minute. This is Peter's iPad. You've been yep, trying that was me. Yeah. I had two questions. Two questions, John. Um, the... Uh, competition clutch you mentioned earlier was that simply the disc or a disc and pressure plate combination that's the pressure plate that and okay. that gives you more clamping force now there is a, a change in the diameter of the disc um and and uh, this disc if you put this up uh, the, the five the five wheel has an an infinite sort of surface but this guy if you take a look there's there's a, there's a there's a little bit of, of thrust plate showing around the outside of this. So you can get a, a disc which is larger um, in diameter. And I want to say it's a TR, is that a TR6 disc? Barney, do you, do, you, do you know? Is that a TR6 disc? Well, an MGB disc is like eight and a quarter inches instead of eight, but you got to match the splines to the input shaft of the gearbox. Yeah, yeah for sure. But it, there's, um, there's something about uh, there's another one. I just talked to talked to somebody just the other day. Yeah, this is this is a this one. Oh, this is an MGA one because it's got ten splines. Right. This is this is eight, and this is the MGB one, and this is also eight. But there's there's a, a, a little bit larger one that gives you just a a little another quarter of an inch. Another quarter of an inch of, of uh, fabric on the outside. So all that means is it's going to uh, last longer. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And just, the other question I had was routinely, do you, when you change the disc, you always replace the pressure plate? Um. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That, that's, that's the rule. That's the rule. But again, um, you know, in my MGA, I've changed the clutch a couple of times, and, and I've never changed the pressure plate because right. there's nothing wrong with it. If this, if this um, thrust plate here, if this mm -hmm. gets on an angle, once it's clamped down, it's on an angle, and it's yeah. you know it's shaking. You can feel that in the pedal. You can feel it in the pedal. Just put your foot on the pedal real lightly, and if you feel that vibration. It, it's it's not it's not satisfactory for for use. On the other hand, if you've got oh heavy, I'm on my dining on my kitchen table here. Uh, these 
the, the older yeah. bits, um, these have got these adjuster uh, adjuster pins in them, and you can you can adjust the adjust the the thrust plate on these. That's that's pretty handy. So all right, all right. All right thank you. Yes, sir. John, can you hold that B clutch up again? Uh, the pressure plate or the disc? Clutch cover, the MGB. Okay, can you turn it around so we can see the other side in the center? Now that release plate in the middle is held in place with an eyelet, like the shoestring eyelet in your shoe. It's really thin. It's held in place by little crimps on the inside bore of the thing. And if that little eyelet falls out of there, the whole clutch fails and falls out. Pieces can come loose and break the bell housing on your transmission. Now that thing lasts about as long as the clutch disc. When the clutch disc wears out, you'd better replace that pressure plate along with it if it's an MGB pressure plate. Always replace the pressure plate along with the disc with B parts. Now the MGA pressure plates, I run those for years and years and never changed them. Gone through a few uh, clutch discs and, and never had to change an MGA pressure plate. Okay, that makes sense. In, anything that comes apart at engine speed in the bell housing is bad news. There's a lot of energy and all that stuff. That stuff's traveling really, really fast. Um, that's real creepy when, when anything like that come, comes apart. That made for a really nice tech session for our club in Chicago the day we did a, a transmission uh, gearbox housing transplant. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I had a good one and a broken one. We just uh, just rebuilt the gearbox when that happened. So we just took all the guts out of the broken housing and put them in a new housing. Made a really nice tech session. Yeah, yep, very nice. Do I have any more questions about clutches? Because it's 807. We've talked about... Clutches for the better part of an hour here. T-type or midget 1500. Oh, stuck clutch. I didn't even mention a stuck clutch. So let's say that you've got a clutch, which um, this has got this has got metal. You can't see it because of my my crappy camera. But there's little little wisps of metal inside here that give it strength. And um, if if you store your car and uh, it's damp, then the clutch disc can rust to the pressure plate or to the flywheel or both. Then you start the car up, you depress the pedal, the pedal feels 100% because it feels like everything is working right, but the clutch disc does not separate from the flywheel or the pressure plate. So you can't get it in gear. So what you have to do in this case, and this is always work, this is a frozen clutch. It's always worked for me. I've never had a failure except once, and that was a midget 1500. And we determined later that the car had been underwater. But um, um, if you can get the car pointed down the street, start it, just just start it, let it idle, get it nice and hot, so it'll start with a with a turn of the key or a pull of the I'll pull the starter uh, cable and then uh, put it in first or second gear, start it in gear, rah, 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 off you go. And immediately you begin depressing the, the, the clutch pedal and the throttle at the same time. So the car is going rah, 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 and it'll break loose. It always breaks loose. I was at Brit Bits in, um, um, in the summer of 2010. And they had an uh, MG magnet there, and they said, "No, nah, it's frozen. We got to take the engine out. Can't do it. It won't come apart. It won't disengage. It's frozen." I saw I can get it loose. And they said, "Well, you can try, but we've all tried. Uh oh, now the stakes are high." So I go out. I can't get that thing to break loose for love or money. And I'm, I mean, I'm huh, this car is almost standing on its nose as I'm going rah, 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 going down the street, just. All, all of a sudden, it's free. Now, I probably ruined all these springs <laughs> um, doing that, but I did get it loose. So you can always get it loose. Two more comments, John. <clears throat> sure. First of all, 
I agree with you 100% that you can always get that clutch disc loose by doing what you described. On the other hand, <clears throat> I agree with something else you constantly say. There's always an exception to every rule. I've had one recently that would not come loose under any circumstances. Myself and the guy who owned the car took turns driving his thing up and down the street, second gear, hold the clutch pedal down and just hammer on off the throttle. And I did it for 15 minutes and he did it for parts of an entire week every day. And we finally had to pull the engine out to get that clutch disc loose. When the engine came out, the clutch disc was stuck to the flywheel. I stuck a tire iron handle through the center of that clutch disc and pulled on it and it did not come loose. <laughs> I finally put the tire iron against the edge of the clutch disc and hit it with a two pound hammer to knock it loose. That's how tight it was. Yep, yep. That car, was, that car was sitting storage outside for, for probably 10 years before that in a humid environment. Okay. Well, that's what I always, <laughs> yeah, every, every, there was just, <laughs> there was just a, a, a Q and A that came through today through the MGB thing. And the guy said, I, I, I want to, uh, I've got to change my sump gasket on my MGB because it's leaking. How's the easiest way to change the sump gasket? And there are six or eight, eight of us at all way in, and I didn't even go there. I said, sump gaskets don't, don't, and the rule is sump gaskets never leak. I said, of course, <laughs> there's an exception. There's always exceptions, but chances are your sump gasket isn't leaking. It's the side covers, but yeah, there's always an exception. There's always an exception. That's about the first one that, that I've heard though. So we had a guy come in with a, with an MGTF uh, uh, when we we're down on Eastern Avenue. This is probably 1985, and he'd taken he'd gone to tune up his TF ten years before, taken the spark plugs out. Maybe he had an adult ADD. I don't know. Got distracted, just didn't get back to it for ten years. So the engine the engine bores have been sitting open, Not, bonnets on it and everything, but that engine was frozen, frozen. And I and I you know he says oh, I got to get the engine rebuilt. And I said let's just see. Let's just see if we can thaw the engine out. And uh, so we ended up taking uh, the carburetors off the, the, you know, off the off the right side of the engine, taking the starter motor out, and uh, we drooled um, um, breakaway or I don't know all kinds of compounds down inside the the cylinders. Took the valve train loose, put pressure on each of the cylinders to blow to blow this, this breakaway mixture down past the rings. And every day we'd put a big pry bar down against the flywheel, try to move it one way, try to move it the other way. For a couple of weeks, nothing happened. And then one day it moved. Once it, once, once, once it moved, then, then you're home free. And then we, we got it loose, towed it around the block with a, with a chain and another car um, that, 20 miles an hour in second gear made that engine made that engine turn over real fast and then started it up. And it smoked a little bit, but it was a lot cheaper <laughs> than a rebuild. So, but there have been people that have left engines with the cylinder heads off. And uh, you can't, sometimes those, those, those corrode. I mean, you need an oxy torch to separate the, the pistons from the bores on that, but I'm way off the su subject. Um, but exceptions, there's always exceptions, exceptions to every rule, which means that since that's a rule, that rule has an exception, and that means there's some rules don't have exceptions, I guess. So anyway, Marty, you you, you got more on clutches, or or does anybody else have something on, on uh, clutches? Hey, hey John. Yeah, Dave. Um, we ran into an issue with a 1500 midget. Um, we replaced the master cylinder because it was leaking. We could not get that to bleed. I mean, we did everything. Um, we finally determined that we got the bleed, but the pedal was right at the floor. You get an eighth of an inch off the floor and the clutch would engage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We 
ordered another master cylinder. We figured it was bad because it worked before we put that on. The next one came in, same thing. We were pulling our hair out. We pulled it apart and matched it to the old one. The piston, the rod, push rod, was about a quarter of an inch shorter than the original one. Yep, yep, That's I, I've heard of that a lot. So on midget 1500s, our trick was you. we got out our blue tip wrench, right, the oxyacetylene torch, and um, took the took the the pedal box cover off so you could let some of the heat out, and you turn up you turn the pedal cherry red hot, pull the pedal up about that far, just bend it. You know normally the pedals are are in in line with each other, the brake and the clutch. You just had to bring that clutch pedal up just a little tiny bit, not a whole lot, and then and then when you depress it, uh, you got more throw. So yeah, or I, I know I talked to people who who had changed their old push rod for the new push rod and got that's that. What we, that's what we ended up doing is taking the old push rod out, put it in the new master cylinder clutch master. Yeah, and make sure. Fine. Use sure that, that, or, use that or punch a hole in the floor to make it bigger. <laughs> or or heat up the pedal and bend the pedal up. That that was our fast way. The other thing, and this is a midget 1500 release bearing fork, and it pivots over here on this side, and then it, the whole thing moves like, like this. And um, um, the pin, which goes over here, is held in with some little squiggly pieces of metal, and that drops out. Now, this thing can, can free float, this, this pivot with a hole, 5 16 hole in it. So we, we had bolts in the shop that were, I don't know, six inches long, something like that. You could reach up in there and drop that bolt down from the top. You didn't have to put a nut on the bottom because the bolt was never going to leave and the bolt wasn't going to drop through because there's a head on the bolt. But we used to re replace the, the pivot pin on the midget 1500s. That was a trick that, that we did. So, but thanks for that comment. That's, I'm, I'm, why do they sell that stuff without without some instruction? They know this. They know they somebody's called them. They, they most of the major suppliers know when there's a snag. And I just wish that they put a little thing in the box. That's all. Do just do due diligence and say, some of our customers have complained that the push rods aren't quite long enough. You can always substitute your original one. But then people call and say, well, why don't you just send them to us correct in the first place? It's, because nobody's going to make 200 of these. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, they got to find it from something else. So anyway, thanks. John, I have a couple of questions in the chat section. I might as well ask you now. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, I have a little bit of a chirping sound when I start off in first gear, letting the clutch out. It's not a squeal, but a chirping sound. Uh, otherwise, it seems to work okay, shifting gears and so forth. The uh, engagement point seems to be about midway in the pedal travel. What what year, what model? It's a 1980, has about 112,000 on it. Okay. Never so is this, is this is this chirp reciprocal? Does it go squeak, 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 squeak and go away? No. It just okay. it just starts when I engage the clutch, and it just it only for a second or two, and then it goes away. Does it scream like a stuck pig? No, <laughs> no, it just um, just a little bit of a you know I I don't want to call it a squeal but a a low uh, frequency type chirp, and then that's it. Well, the the uh, the first motion shaft sits in the back of the crank, and the first motion shaft. You know, the clutch is here. The first motion shaft is resting in the back of the crank. And if that should dry out or or something, sometimes when there's a difference in speed between the crank and the first motion shaft, um, it, you can get a you can get a, a a squeal. Or if the spigot bushing's worn out, you can get a squeal. Um, but you can't feel it in the pedal. No. 
and I, when I downshift, you know, um, as long as I don't do it too quickly, I don't get any grinding gears or anything like that. Well, just, you know, just turn off the radio, I guess, <laughs> you know, I was just kind of wondering if that was a warning sign that says, yeah, sure, hey, hey, hey. sure. But I, I can't, I can't, if I, if I was able to hear it, I could probably say, oh, 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 you know, or it would remind me, but I, I can't get there from here. So. Okay. Another yeah. question is, is I've heard that if you have a non overdrive transmission, there is a way to change the clutch out without pulling the engine that, yeah, if you've if you've done it a couple of times before, then you can save a lot of time. But if it's your first time, and let's say you're 60 years old or older, you'll wish you'd taken the clutch out, the engine out. Yes, okay. you can. You absolutely can. Um, you disconnect the the drive shaft, the the you know the wiring, the speedo cable, the cross member, uh, the whole works. You know the whole works falls down. You reach in through the top. You take the remote control off by by going through the top and also going up from underneath and undoing the bolts on the six bolts to hold the remote control on the gearbox. Pull that off. Turn the gearbox all but upside down and uh, pull it back, and it drops out. Then when you put it back in, you got to get it lined up, and um, uh, that's dicey. Then, um, then you've got to roll this thing back up into place, and you've got to blindly put the remote control on it. And I, I, I talked to a guy over over the course of three months, and I just kept saying, "Take the engine and gearbox out." Well, the gearbox is already in. I said, you're calling me, dude. You know, you're asking me how to get this remote control on. He couldn't do it. He couldn't find anybody to, to do it. Somebody said that, that they could do it, but they, they couldn't. My guys in the shop, that's the way they changed the clutch, and they could do it real fast. But that was after they tried it three or four times and got got the technique. And and my my approach now is that everything else needs to be done. The, the motor mounts should be changed. The engine brackets have to have a weld, uh, a gusset welded into them. And there's lots of other stuff that's going on. Just just do it slowly and take the engine out. But that's me. Okay, thank you. John, I've got a, uh, a situation with a 57 MGA. Thanks for your discussion there. Um, it appears as if I've got a, a failure to disengage. The, the pedal is stiff. Um, I just, I can jam it into first and get going, and then uh, the car drives fine. Um, and I've bled this a couple of times. A number of people have talked about bleeding. I like your idea of the um, finger on the... Um, that's when it's dry, but, but that, that's when it's dry. Once, once you've, you've already got fluid in it, um, if, if you think maybe there's there's air in the system then take a clear hose um you know a clear plastic hose and put it on the bleeder put it into a bottle um which has got some fluid in it all, already and and have have you know open down close up and watch and and um you you should be free of, of bubble you know of course you gotta get stop part way through and go up and put fluid in the master cylinder, but um, you should have zero bubbles in there. Sometimes with a, with a replacement slave, I've seen this, and that when the slave is mounted on the side of the gearbox, the bleeder hole has to be at 12 o'clock, but the bleeder hole isn't. It's at 1 or 11 or something or other. So there's still a tiny little bubble of, of air up there. And, and that that slave cylinder piston moves when you look at it moving you go oh my god it's moving an inch uh, -uh. it's moving three eighths to seven sixteenths of an inch i you put a ruler put a ruler up up against it and and measure it just uh, how much how much is, does it move three eighths to seven sixteenths if it's not moving three eighths of an inch then it's not moving enough for sure but um but if it is 
moving three to seven sixteenths, then the problem you've got is something else. If it's not moving that far, maybe it's it's air in the system. And there's a lot of places on the MGA where you can get air. I mean, you've got a you've got a fitting on the on the back of the of a master cylinder that's um, a banjo bolt. So that that can be loose. The line into the banjo can be loose. The line into the into the flex hose can be loose. The flex hose into the slave can be loose. Um, and not much, but air, you know, maybe no fluid will squirt out of there, but air is a lot smaller molecularly than than fluid. And and um, so it won't leak fluid out, but it'll suck air in. But if you use that clear hose, you'll be able to tell immediately whether you you've expelled all the air or not. So if you've got, for those who purchased a slave and you can't get a bled, in other words, you're, you're bleeding it and the, the fluid's coming out without any bubbles in it at all, open the bleeder, open the bleeder with your 7 16 wrench, take the heel of your hand and a, maybe a rag on, on your hand to protect it and push, open the bleeder and push really hard, real fast and real hard against the, the slave um the the fork the, the you know the, the the bottom of the fork and and push that push that piston into the slave real fast real hard and then close the bleeder before you get to the end of the <laughs> end of the bore where's that i don't know you know <laughs> you know just open it push it because that force will take that little tiny bubble that's sitting up in the wrong place and 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 expel him out the out the slave hose out, out the out the bleeder rather. So um, by using the heel of your hand and, and bleeding it down underneath, sometimes you can get that little bubble out. But you know, try try some of the stuff you've heard tonight. And if you don't, if you can't get anywhere, call call me back. You know, tomorrow or the next day or something. Like that. I'll I'll see if I can help you go a little further. Oh, one time. I gotta, I gotta say this, especially for Barney. One time, I, I had a guy who said, who said my clutch only works when I, when I, I can only get in motion. It'll only engage when I depress the clutch. I said, no, that, that, that's, that can't be. He goes, well, I'll drive it down and show it to you. He drove it down. He drove it down. He had to have the clutch pedal depressed all the time that he was driving it. And so what had happened? is somebody had the master cylinder out or was fiddling with the push rods on the master cylinder, this is MGA, and they had adjusted the, the pin in the master cylinder so that it was thrown out. It, it was, it was a disengaged. Naturally sitting there, it was as though you had your foot on the clutch. And then when you did put your foot on the clutch, it took the, oh, let me grab this. It took the fingers here and jammed them in here so far that it scrubbed against the clutch disc. You you can hear it just just at the end of the end of the push. <laughs> it's like oh my gosh. Anyway, that was a one off. Nothing to do with what, what what's going on with you. It's just a story for Barney. So one of those uh, MGA stories. John, speaking of uh, bleeding, you ever use speed bleeders? No. I've been using them for the last couple of years, and they've been great. They just uh, replace okay. the, the bleeder nipple with a little spring-loaded uh, ball bearing. It makes it a lot easier. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I've always been a two-person bleeder. I've, I've tried. I, th I think I've probably tried those, and then... Um, I've tried the the mighty vac, you know, with a, you know, with, with that. But but as soon as you crack the bleeder loose, it'll draw air from around the around the threads. It's it's um, yeah. I'm yeah. The speed bleeder has a has a, a, a material around the threads, so you can't draw air in that way. Good. Okay. Speed bleeder is a little spring loaded ball in, in there. Yeah. 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 They're they're expensive because. You know, you can buy a, a bleeder for like three dollars versus thirteen dollars for a speed bleeder. Okay. Okay. I've used your method this past vacation 
In in a gas station parking lot, it works really well. <laughs> well the the only it's the only thing, yeah, the finger method. The only thing is the brake fluid ruined my watch band. <laughs> it corroded it. But that was my fault. They it, ruined, have, it ruined watch, what? My watch band, where oh. it connected to the watch, yeah. Yeah, uh, brake fluid is a nice stuff. It's it's uh, it, nothing works. Well, zip strip. Zip strip works. Maybe, maybe work, zip strip works faster than brake fluid, but Boy, brake fluid just takes the paint off everything, ruins stuff. Yeah, you got to be real cautious of it. In the MGA, which is, you know, got the master cylinder all up there in the corner, you can't get fluid in that thing for love or money without spilling it. Um, that's the only car that I'm I'm keen I'm keen to see. Well, other ones have got silicone fluid in them. You know, that's the single advantage of that silicone fluid. On the other hand, that gets on stuff, and it's just, it's greasy. It's hard to get off, but not as hard as anti seeds Anyway. Don't, don't, don't plan on painting afterwards. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, let me hit the hit, hit the chat section, because we're already at, at 8.30, and I haven't even got there. Uh, Rich S., Rich, if you're still on, if you've waited all, all this time, uh, I'm a do-it-yourself garage mechanic. I pulled apart a couple of clutches, MGA and a VW Beetle. I don't understand why holding the clutch pedal down in neutral wears out the clutch. Uh, does this disengage the clutch completely from the flywheel? Where does the wear come from? It comes from the graphite. It comes from the graphite that's rubbing against this surface. And the, the longer you leave it depressed, the more graphite you're gonna wear away. Roller bearing, no problem. But I, I'm always keen on on starting it, starting it neutral. Yep, foot off the clutch. St um, starting stop signs, stop start traffic. Foot off the clutch. Dean, everybody, what's the safe? Hey, we're away from clutches. What's the safe way to energize the electrical system after installing a, a new wiring harness? Seventy-two midget meticulously followed the diagrams. Tested wires for continuity. Tested connections and bulbs. Where to put a low amp fuse to blow first in the event of a problem. Well, back of the battery. That's the best place uh, until you want to engage the starter motor. I mean, the starter motor draws 100 amps. So there's no point in having a 100 amp fuse back, back there because your whole wiring diagram, your whole wiring loom will, will uh, meld away if you're able to draw 100 amps to it. So, um, just a uh, twenty, just an inline inline fuse between your your uh, the positive post of your battery and the and the and the uh, positive wire. Maybe a ten or twenty amp fuse. I don't know what I don't know what headlights draw. I don't. Know. I would think twenty amps would be enough, but um, that that would be the case. Or you can just be bold and just do it. Hook it up. Wait. Smell. Watch, you got it all hooked up correctly. You've been really meticulous. It'll be all right. Easy for me to say. Um, I think, as that, as I think the best, ad, best advice is to connect one circuit at a time. Check each one in turn as you're connecting it. So you don't have multiple faults in that wiring harness all at once. And the other thing that works, the other thing that works really neat is just get yourself a cheap battery charge and it's good for about 10 amps. Pull the battery cables off, put the battery charger on there. So you got 12 volts, but no more than 10 amps. And you can test everything in a whole car. And if you got a short, you're not going to burn anything up. Those are those excellent, excellent ideas. So by testing circuit by circuit, um, that's di disconnecting the, you get a 72 midget, that's disconnecting the, I think it's the left-hand side of the, of the fuse box. I can't remember where the green wires are on the, it's a reverse of an MGB. But uh, pull off the purple wires off the fuse box and the green wires, and uh, turn the ignition on. And the, the the fuel pump is not is not fused. Headlights are not fused. Uh, parking lights are fused, and and the horns are fused. And then and then just start plugging in the the purples and the greens and testing stuff step by step. So we put an amp meter in stuff. You could. You could, but you don't see, you, you can't watch the ammeter the whole time. I mean, you can, absolutely. I mean, the ammeter will do it. Um, After we test 
to put it together, we uh, put the ammeter in between each circuit and make sure that it's not drawing any juice. Okay. Sure. That way, if you get a little bit of a draw, um, you know, you'll you'll know it right away. The digital ones are the best. Okay. That's a good idea, too. Okay. Let's see. Rich S. has got a, um, a shout out for the Gunson Easy Bleed. So maybe that's what uh, Fred was talking about. John Tershak, bleeding the clutch slave, wondering how it would work out if we replaced the bleeder with a speed bleeder. Okay, so we've, we've talked about that. Um, um, Don Bueller. Uh, in the oh, hey, John. Yes. I, I one more comment on getting air in the clutch. Clutches are on MGAs and Bs are notoriously difficult to bleed because the fluid flows downhill and the air wants to bubble uphill. Okay, but there's there's another way to get air into that system that you cannot get out under any circumstances ever. If you rebuild a master cylinder with a new packing kit in it, and you got new rubber cup seals in there that are kind of stiff, <clears throat> and then you go to bleed the system, you may find that you can't get the air out of the clutch circuit. And you can go underneath, <clears throat> open the bleed nipple, put your finger on it, have somebody pump that pedal. Pump it and pump it and pump it, and you'll get air out and air out and burp air out and burp more air out forever and you'll never get fluid to come out but what's going on is when you let the clutch pedal up the new master cylinder seal creates a slight vacuum downstream and that vacuum can pull air in past the clutch slave seal cup so you end up having to replace the clutch slave seal cup rebuild or replace the clutch slave along with it okay that goes back to my my suggestion that if you can do clutch hydraulics, you do all three, master master slave and slave hose. So, let's see. Here we got um, Don Bueller, the Moss Motoring Issue Three, twenty twenty three. An article discussed one of a kind tools, do it yourself valve compression by Russ Van Tyne. I was wondering if you'd read it in your impression. I have not read it. I haven't. I, I just was is that is that the one that just came out? Uh issue three? I would think so. I didn't I didn't read about that. Uh, valve valve compressor. I ha I haven't read that. I have not, so I've got no no comments at all. So Marty's got a, a note in here about uh, um hey, John. Yes. Yeah, yeah, this is Tom Bueller. I was wondering if anyone else had read that and had any thoughts on it because probably it's uh, it's an interesting fix and most mechanics probably would laugh at that, but uh, it's a, it was something that I had dealt with since I recently had my head re redone with uh, grinding and all this stuff. But, but uh, this individual Russ Van Tyne indicated that there's so many people that do head valves and and things like that that don't understand all the intricacies of the spring valves and everything but uh if you haven't read it uh that would be great um uh, i would uh like any input that you might have thank you I, I stepped I stepped away to look at my pile of unread magazines, and I I thought maybe it was in there, but I I don't see it. I thought maybe I glanced at it, but next time I'm I'm reminded. I'll I'll try to remember to to do that. Hey, next John. Time. hey Rob. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah, I got it on my coffee table. I can drop it off if you want to take a uh, read. I'll be at the shop all day tomorrow. Well, in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, uh, were you there like ten o'clock or so? Afternoon. I mean, yeah, okay. I should I should be there about ten. I should be there about eleven, but but it's always it's uh, text me first. Just, okay, I'll do that. But yeah, yeah I, I'm sitting on the coffee. Thanks. Thank you. I, I do I do have a spinner wrench too that I have yet to um, use um, and uh, and report back on. A guy sent me a. a a spinner wrench, which is just unbelievably beautiful. And uh, it's got little little rollers on it. And it just, 
the whole goal is not to do damage on the on the wing nuts. Um, and um, anyway, I, I have yet to review that, make comments about that. George Curl, thanks for the 22nd rule in bleeding. I wish I'd known that 30 years ago because you've been trying to bleed it since, right? <laughs> I'm so, sorry. Um, I, I keep graphite throwout bearings in my spare kit. Never had a failure since I started carrying them as spares. That is one of those rules. There are exceptions, but if you carry the part, you won't need it. You carry a whole a whole distributor with the cap and wires and everything. Your distributor won't fail if you carry a whole alternator generator. It won't fail. Um, so you can make a case for carrying lots of lots of used parts. Darren, to everybody, seventy three MGB, two thousand miles on a rebuilt engine. When cold, there's an abnormally loud chick for about 60 seconds, then it goes away. Sounds like one rocker. I tried listening with a hose and also slipping a feeler gauge on each rocker, but I can't identify it. Could this be something other than a rocker? Sure. Um, my question, is Darren still on? Are you still on? Darren, have you waited all this time for an answer? Hi, John. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Um, do you get oil pressure instantly when it starts up? Instantly, yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. But something's not getting oil. So can you um can you can you get someone else one you know, once you let the thing settle back down for however long it has to be, can you take the valve cover off and go underneath the bonnet and have somebody else start it up and then quick listen? Well, I've done that. It? Yeah, yeah. I've started it with the rock cover off, and I, I have time to go slip a feeler gauge under each rocker to see if I can find one. Um, it's just a booger. But after sixty seconds, it goes away. It goes away. I get I get sixty seconds worth of diagnostics a day. After sixty seconds, might as well wait till the next day before it comes back. And it's a it's a fairly loud tick. Ever one pop cause very interesting can you guys very interesting i want you give me a jingle tomorrow afternoon or something let's talk about this some more because i can't you know i mean i'm, I'm up i'm up on the vowels for sure i mean yeah. what else i mean it, it 68 69 mgbs they'll they'll rattle they'll rattle until you get oil pressure but the instant you get oil pressure the rattle goes away if you got that old horrid horrid upside down Oil filter. I've got to hit the mute all because I got some some. Uh, there we go. Um, I had some background yeah. stuff, but Darren, you can unmute yourself when that time comes. But Alex is still is still. Um, uh, there we go. All right. So Darren, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, yeah. um, I you know it's like what else. Is it, it it's reciprocal? It, it is having to do with the with the speed of the engine, of course. Absolutely, it just sounds like a like a valve ticking really really bad. But I can't, you know, going over each one with a hose, I can't identify it, and I can't make it go away with a feeler gauge. You bought a ten thousands feeler. You stick it in there. Yep. 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 Boy, I don't know. I. Well, I don't feel so bad that I've been stumped this long. <laughs> Uh, that's a, it's, that's an interesting one. Um, I, yeah, give me a jingle tomorrow. Let's let's talk some more about it because I can't I can't get my head around that at all. I mean, it, it, you know, because you've been you've been trying to sort you've tried to find this half a dozen or a dozen times now, right? I mean, or, or two or two dozen or three dozen. Yeah, okay. it's been a, it's been a while. Oh my gosh, one it's of the like, ports could be blocked somewhat because I've had that. Uh, when you clean, rebuild the motor, you don't get a, the head. You don't get one of the ports totally clean. And it takes a little extra pressure for it to come back around. Yeah, you're talking um, about going a, up into a, the head. A, a valve but, sticking? But, um, but usually, if, there, if, you, you know, if you've got a, a valve which is noisy and you put a Say a 10, 12 thousandths feeler between the between the rocker and the valve stem, it'll it'll cover up that noise. That's how you determine whether you've got a valve out of adjustment or a bad cam. 
And um, um, the fact that that doesn't make any difference on, on all, all eight valves doesn't make me think that it's a oil starvation. I, I agree with you. I, I, there's some, I mean, something. Hey, hey, John, so, sorry. I had a quick input. I tried before, but uh, I think you muted all. That was my problem with my audio. Okay. Um, I had a similar problem where I had an exhaust manifold leak. It wasn't quite tight. One of my Very exhaust Very nice. Yes. As yes. soon as the exhaust manifold started to heat up, it sealed. You you got it. I mean, I mean, if you got if you got a leak through the exhaust gasket, it can sound. Here we go. It can sound just like this. It can sound. It, it maybe doesn't got quite the metallic ring, but oh my gosh, yes. So well, next next time, go around with your hose and listen and listen around the um, listen around the exhaust manifold. Between the head, not between the exhaust manifold and the exhaust pipe, but between the exhaust manifold and the head. Yeah, I considered that, and a couple of weeks ago, I actually changed that in to take exhaust gasket. All right, okay. And, um, I, I've gone as far as that to try to try to oh. find this issue. So, what would be down in the chain? Do you have a do you have a um, stethoscope for listening um, um no but i can i can acquire one i mean you know i don't know if harbor freight sells something so esoteric as that but um i've got i've got a nice military one now terry luke gave, gave it to me compliments to the u.s government i guess and um and that thing is nice you put that on it's got a nice diaphragm in it and and you can put it up against the engine and you could you i mean i'm, I'm wondering about the front cover you know, is it is it the is it the the uh, chain tensioner banging back and forth because it hasn't got pressure up there yet? Um, you know, it's and with that, at least you can you can um, uh, you can hunt. You know, just listen to the front of the engine one day, and listen to the back of the engine the next day. You know, but I yeah, a stethoscope, um, a stethoscope like that would, would be nice. It's got a a long metal finger on it. Yeah, well, I'll certainly get one of those and, and poke around on the engine yeah, a little more. I'm so, real interested to find out what, what what this Alex. I thought Alex had the answer there. I, you know, I should have mentioned that. I should have mentioned that I that I went that far yeah, already. Yeah, I, I I had that once before in the shop, and it just for all the world, you know, you get some weird stuff. I had a guy with a TR6 that came in, and uh, his his tack was making this horrible noise. Tick 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 tick. I mean, you could almost feel it in the tack, you know? And so, how well, you'd have the tack cable changed twice, couldn't get rid of it. Well, the last guy that worked on his car had hooked up a vacuum advance unit that he had, I don't know, three individual, some aftermarket carburetors supposed to make the car go faster, I don't know. Um, anyway, he pulled vacuum off one leg off of one out of six legs and so this vacuum was going, um, um, it, it would it would suck, you know, on a reciprocal basis. And on a TR6, the tack cable comes off the bottom of the distributor. So his vacuum advance unit was was banging back and forth, tung 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 tung, and 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 it was evident, evidencing itself, presenting itself through the tachometer on the dash. It, it, sometimes it's there are such bizarre little things that happen. So anyway, yeah. okay. Well, I appreciate it. And I'll um I'll, I'll try the uh, stethoscope, and I may uh, give you a call tomorrow see if you uh, thought of anything else. But I appreciate yeah. it. Okay. Thank you, John. By, by the way, John, uh, Harbor Freight has stethoscopes for eight dollars. There we go. Got there my name go. written on it. I'll head there tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, right. guys. Hey, thank you. So Chris Plank, I know who Chris Plank is, 52 TD, judders hard when engaged in anything above idle. Diagnosis is worn gearbox mount, uh, then bad clutch springs, any other diagnosis? No, that's about it on that. Chris, are you still on? Have you waited all this time? Hey, John, yeah, I'm here. How hey, are you? Very nice, nice garage. So Chris, 
Chris was in my employee when he was 19 years old or something about 30 years ago. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, um, no, that's those are the two things. But there's a new there's a new lever that you can buy from Moss or instructions you can get for moving the the uh, the rod that goes from that lever that hangs off the side of the sump back to the gearbox. You yep. change the position of, of that a little bit, and it makes the clutch a lot nicer. A lot of people are are um, real real excited about that. I know Moss sells that extra piece. Oh, very good. All right. Thank you. Yeah, call call me any. I should stop out and see any time. I'm I'm out. Oh, likewise. I'm always in Comstock Park. I should stop in and say hi again. I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. See ya. Yep. Let's see. Bill Henley. I hit a bump in the road. The clutch disengaged and could not get it back in gear. It turns out the metal shaft on the clutch plate had come free from the clutch plate. I can't do that kind of work, but the mechanic said he had never seen that happen before. Uh, he showed it to me, and sure enough, it was rotating freely from the plate. I was the new owner and had no idea when or what part had been used uh, and when, from what supplier. Well, that's interesting, a bump in the road. Jeez, jeez. There was a guy up at um, Traverse City at the MGB meet a couple of summers ago, and uh, he'd hit a bump in the road. And he said, something happened to my overdrive. And I said, well, let's go out and drive it and listen to the overdrive. So we're out driving and I, I kick it into overdrive and uh, it made it made this unearthly sound. It's like, oops, no, I guess you're driving back to Toronto in, in fourth gear. Um, bumps is just funny. So anyway, turns out the metal shaft on the clutch plate had come free from the um, from the clutch plate. So very interesting, very interesting. Jim Nakos. Do you have any information on what brand of throw up bearings are good ones? Uh, according to Barney, not the power tune brand. You know, I've had, it's never good to beat up on a supplier, ever. It just, it's no one's interest. But I've had real bad luck with power tune break, break shoots. Um, also, I wasn't clear whether or not you recommended the roller type of throw up bearing seen that today's graphite ones are not very good. I've done several clutch replacements in my life and roller bearings seem to be the norm. Also, second question, I have to change the clutch in my 63B. Was wondering if I could get the transmission out by itself without removing the engine and transmission together. All right, just take the engine out. Just take the engine out by, by itself. That's easy enough. It's easier than trying to get the gearbox out. And I'm not sure the gearbox will come out um, on, the, on the earlier cars. I know it will on the four synchro ones. But um, anyway, that, that first one, uh, again, it, I, except for Barney's experience with a, with a bad throw up bearing on his, well, that was an MGB, but that was the power tune one. So I, I, I think whatever problem there was, that stuff's worked through the supply, the supply lines now. That doesn't mean that if you buy one from someone, you know, who's selling it on, on eBay that you won't get a bad one. But if you get one from one of the major suppliers, apparently it's okay. Harry's iPhone. Can you say anything about lightening the flywheel? Well, remember the flywheel is heavy so that you've got a lot of reserve energy to launch you from a stop sign or stoplight. So the lighter the flywheel, the, the less, um, less momentum you have, not energy, momentum, the less momentum you have in the flywheel and, and um, you can end up um, stalling the engine uh, unless you've got a higher idle. So, well, the race cars have got light and flywheels. So they idle at 4,000 RPM and they only start off once. After that, they, they never hit a, a stop sign or a stoplight. Um, 
if you are going to lighten a flywheel, the, the, the late model MGB flywheels are light just the way they are. Uh, the MGA flywheels are, are ungodly heavy. They're 27 pounds. I remember, I just remember that. I remember weighing them. And you can put a, either put a, a three main MGB flywheel on or um, Barney probably has on his site someplace instructions from somebody who's, who's lightened one before. You gotta be real cautious though. That's a lot of rotating mass and, and it's not something that, you know you wanna do yourself because everything all has to stay in balance. So um, except for the original MGA, I, I wouldn't lighten the flywheel. What DOT type and brands of conventional glycol brake fluid do you recommend? Dot uh, three or dot four? They, they, those two seem to be, I don't know what the difference in them is. Dot five is silicone. Um, I want to say that dot four doesn't eat paint quite so fast, but um, that's, a, uh, that's just, that's a, not a tested uh, scientific answer. It's just gut. I, John, on a brake fluid, I was, since you can't get Castrol anymore, I went online and uh, was asking what's the best dot four brake fluid you can get. And, and most sites came up with Pennzoil. Okay. So that's what I bought. So, Preston. Uh, not Pens, Pennzoil, Prestone, okay. I'm sorry. And, uh, Probably like Prestone they, antifreeze? No, yeah, <laughs> Prestone makes good stuff. So, okay. Uh, I use a lot of Prestone products, but I, I can't. I can't give any evidence that's any better than anything else. Just what I read. Okay. Thanks. John, got a couple more comments on the flywheel weight. Yeah. Uh, I have the MGA flywheel weight at 28 pounds and the late Mark II flywheel at 20 pounds that carried over to the MGB. It's eight pounds difference. I got the MGB stuff in my car and I absolutely love that 20 pound flywheel. The lightweight flywheels you can buy uh, are typically 14 pounds, and they are, I think, overkill, too light. Uh, if you put that in your car, you're likely to stall the engine trying to pull off the line. There's just not enough inertia to get your car going. And years ago, somebody put uh, a lightweight clutch in along with a competition, or a competition clutch along with a lightweight aluminum flywheel. And the car was just undrivable. You could not get that thing to move without killing the engine. And if you gunned the throttle enough to get it to move, it would just burn the tires off the line. And there was nothing in between. <laughs> he sold the car to some unsuspecting guy and he took it back and they finally took out the flywheel and the clutch and put the standard components in. Yeah, uh, I think 14 pounds is good for competition, but not good for the street. Not, I, I agree with you there. To Twenty. I don't. What's a what's a normal MGB flywheel weight? Like an eight, like twenty twenty pounds no, for the early ones. The, the small ones. The later ones. I wonder. I I don't remember having. Well, they're weight bigger weight. diameter with a bigger ring gear, but they're thinner. So I'm not yeah, sure I, if they're lighter yeah. weight. They must may be, be the a, same. Must be around that that same weight. So okay. Thanks. Um, Lee Gilbert, speedometer calibration question. If the tag is correct, the speed will read 60 at 3,000 RPM, 80 at 4,000, and 90 at 4,500 to avoid getting run over by SUVs. Is that something that can be corrected? Way above the 18 um, miles per hour per thousand RPM in the owner's manual. Well, <clears throat> If you want it, there's, there are two units within that clock, right? There's the speedometer and there's the odometer. Okay. So you can, you can um, trust the government. Here, here we go. Or not something I often do, but I, the, longer, the lo longer the test you make, next time you're out on the expressway, you know, just, you know, the, like, you know, write down, get your, get your passenger, write down what your, your, uh, tripodometer says at a mile marker and then drive 50 miles, you know, and just how, how close is it within a couple percent? That's probably as about as close as you're going to get. And you, you can also, if you've got an iPhone, I've got an iPhone, 
um, you, there's a speedometer app you can download and put it right down in the car and it'll tell you how fast you're going. And if there's a problem with, uh, with, with what your speedometer is saying versus um, the, the actual speed of the, of the car, you can have that correct as well as um, if the odometer is way off, you know? So that's, that's the first thing is to see if the, well, but to see if the odometer is off. So what, what year model do you have? A 79B. Okay, all right. Well, those are all clocked at 1,000 turns per mile. And um, I think that old information probably is still is still based on like a you know probably a 1964 MGB with bias ply tires or something, and maybe those are aren't quite as big, big around as the ones you've got. So there is some some change there, but I I haven't um, my MGA my MGA when I'm doing I'm when I'm doing five grand I'm doing ninety. Um, so I, I guess you could figure out from that, but I've got I've got 15 inch tires, not 14 inch. So mm -hmm. yeah. so anyway, two units, odometer and speedometer. Check the odometer against mile markers on the expressway. That's where you get to trust the government. And then mm -hmm. Elon Musk or whoever's got those satellites up to to use <laughs> use your uh, <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. Okay, you're very welcome. John, just a, a hint of a caution on using the cell phone. GPS is sample. So uh, if you're on down a relatively straight road, uh, maybe with some uh, slow curves, they're very accurate. If you get into a real twisty situation, they measure from point to point to point like the crow flies and they'll be way off of a regular mechanical. Okay. You Thank know, you. John okay. Reed, on the interstate, they're fairly accurate. I'm losing uh, 1.6 miles for every 100 miles. But going through the two-lane roads like Montana had me losing four miles per 100. Yes, okay. uh, our different difference is like different. 20%. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're still paying for that, that war. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> Let's see, Barney. Oh. Okay, let's see. Marty. Uh, uh, Marty's just reminding everybody that my tech time is 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so that works out. John Tershak, uh, Flywheels. Um, Oh, a remark about flywheels. John Tershak's Model A flywheel weighs 65 pounds. Interesting. And here, he's also got another note here. On the air in the clutch slave, an older mechanic told me to prop the clutch pedal down for a day or so. Just push the clutch pedal to the floor, and you use what you want. You use a two by four in there or something to keep it depressed, and that worked for me," says John Tershak. So I, I've never heard of that. That's interesting. That's interesting. I that's uh, gosh. Anyway, that's the end of our chat section, and it's nine oh three. So we still got ninety four people. I was going to ask tonight because last time when we when we got on that guy. Logged in real fast, real early on, and he said, oh, "I just want to let you know I'm calling in from Lagos, Nigeria." So I was wondering who who is the southernmost and most distant person on our call tonight. I, we had Gary Greenspoon; he's from, from uh, Victoria Island, in BC. I heard from him. Um, did anybody else farther away tonight? And the person, John. John. Yes, it's Gary here. If I were in, in Victor on Victoria Island, it would be up in the around the Arctic Circle, around Greenland. There is a Victoria Island. Oh, sorry. I'm, 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 I'm Vancouver Island. Yeah, Vancouver Island. I, that's what I meant. Yeah, I know. That's what I meant. <laughs> okay. All right. Don't so, want to, I don't want to claim any false distances here. All right. 
Okay. Okay. Well, hey, we uh, we've gone through it tonight. We had a lot of people. And the uh, Doug, are you on tonight? Doug Clark. Doug's my official counter, and I have my hat challenge. I brought a hat out tonight for my hat challenge with with Doug Clark. But if he's not on, we'll have to ask Marty to see how many people we had on tonight. I saw 150. All right. Okay. All right. Well, clutches are not as exciting as S2 carburetors. So we had 217 on that that night. So, oh, my gosh. Hey, John. <clears throat> yeah. I'd like another comment about clutches and how they work. I got some information on competition clutch conversion. Okay. Should be real brief, I hope. Uh, all through the 90s, I was autocrossing with SCCA. And at that time, I ended up putting an MGB clutch in the car because I had an oil leak that messed up my clutch and it slipped, and I thought that might help. Turns out it didn't make any difference. You got oil on your clutch, it's going to slip anyway. But that's the way I started out putting an MGB clutch in the car. Uh, when this was slipping, I put a competition pressure plate in there, and that didn't help either. It was still slipping from the oil. So I had a miserable time fixing the oil leak from the back of the engine, which is when I invented this rubber seal that goes on the back end of the crankshaft. But once I got the oil leak fixed, I was running around with a MGB clutch in the car and a competition pressure plate. But the thing was amazing. It was about 30% higher pedal force, but it worked like a charm. Uh, autocross is like drag racing. You're always rev the engine up and pop the clutch to get off the line as quick as you can. Uh, and then I put race tires on the car. What, before I put race tires on the car, it was spinning the wheels and it was wearing out clutch discs. After I put race tires on the car, then I had a competition clutch in it. And this is the immovable object meeting the irresistible force. You got a competition clutch that refuses to slip and tires that refuse to slip. And then I was replacing universal joints in the prop shafts once a year like clockwork. <laughs> But the competition clutch is absolutely amazing. And I had it in there for three years before I had a different problem and had to pull the engine out. And the friction disc was a standard MGB friction disc. Looked like brand new after three years of that kind of abuse. Before that, I was changing clutch discs once a year. This one looked like brand new, but the rivets and the friction material finally came loose and I had to throw it out. So I, I read that the, that the competition clutch used in the MGB was the, was the heavy duty clutch used in a Sherpa van um, that, that uses the, the B series engine. And that's where that, I heard that. I don't know that that, that MGB engine was, was the B series engine was used in all kinds of stuff in, the, in this heavy duty, this heavy duty van, the Sherpa van. Um, had a had a heavy clutch in it, and that's that's where those competition clutches came from. So I I don't know, but I, that's what I've got in my MGA. I've had it in there since 1980. It's just great. I mean, I haven't changed the, the pressure plate yet. So yeah, well, I I wore out, damaged the MGA pressure, the MGB pressure plate after a few years. The rivets sure. came loose, uh, but after that, the clutch wasn't slipping and never wore out. But then I was wearing out tires from burning out off the line all the time. Yeah, you can only do that when you're working. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was competitive. I was going to do what was good for lap times, not what was good for the car. Yeah, yeah. All right. John, so, hey. John this is Dave Balsilli. I've got yeah. a question for, for sure. Bob and Gloria Cook. I met you guys down at Kansas City during the uh, Heartland uh all british car show and you guys were heading out on a trip uh out west i just wondered how that went for you <laughs> how much time have we got uh, <laughs> i um i spun the rear wheel hub in in uh, missoula got towed up to uh, bruce uh, um uh, what's his name uh, Feldman, and he uh, he did it's a one-day job it took six days because uh, no no overnight shipping and that was fine. And after we got into Washington State, um, I had to replace a a, a brake line hose, and uh, that was good. Then my my slave cylinder, the piston started coming out. I had to take care of that. 
And uh, yeah, everything was good after that, except on the way to, uh, after we got home, chain, pulled the engine, replaced everything on the way to uh, um, the rocks, MGs on the rocks, we, uh, our battery shorted out. And it's like in the middle of in the middle Harrisburg, of Harrisburg <laughs> pull in a parking lot, shut the car up or something, and it would had no juice. And uh, so I'm getting ready to call AAA, and a couple pull up this kind of funny. You pull up in an SUV, real loud. She's going, "We're here to save you. We're gonna." And Gloria said, "Get ready to dial 911." <laughs> <laughs> you never know. But they jump started us. Uh, told us where the nearest Walmart was. We got a seventy dollar. 26 group 26 battery and uh, everything was fine after that but so this is so more problems this year than we've ever had but but nothing that kept us from continually being on the road but we it was it was beautiful the trip was beautiful uh, other than those few mishaps the trip was incredibly gorgeous and uh, john i want to thank you for your input too when we called you we, we just oh hey I, 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 I was not able to diagnose your your rear hub just that that was <laughs> that was too too bizarre. Too we bizarre. uh we should have listened to Gloria. She said, I think the sound's coming from the rear end. And I said, well, you know, if, transmission. <laughs> yeah. If a guide told us that, we we would have listened, of course. So um, <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> um so yeah, so there's another thing that can happen, you know, where you you lose forward motion, but there's no noise at all. You know, you let the clutch out, and and oh, there might be some whirring, but but you don't go anywhere when you snap a half shaft, which doesn't happen on an MGB, but happens on A's and T types. Um, in that, you can look at the speedometer. So you know, you rev the thing up to to two thousand RPM, and it says you're doing, you know, you're doing fifteen twenty miles an hour. But you're not going anywhere. You know the drive shaft is turning, so you know the problem lies um, behind the behind the drive shaft. So, yeah, if we if we just listened, if we just listened to Gloria a little bit more, <laughs> I could have, and I would have said, "Well, what about your speedo? Is your speedo, is your speedo?" But that noise was just—it was so horrible. Why would you even? Why would you? Why would you make it make that noise any more than you had to? Oh my gosh! That was, it, it was terrible, but uh, it all worked out. And I met Bruce Feldman, and, he, and he's a nice guy, and uh, has a nice um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Airbnb. Airbnb house. He he gave it to us for less than half price. We didn't. Yeah, <laughs> you can't and fifteen percent discount on the labor and nice, very nice. Yeah, and he's just nice. He's going to write it up a little bit in his article right. on the MG driver. He does every okay. issue. He's going to put us in there. So, um, but it was, yeah, I can't tell you how many people from our last tech session, how many people on at the rocks came up to us. Hey, we're surprised to see you here. <laughs> <laughs> but we they pull the engine, do what you got to do, put it back in and, and go, you know, you so gotta back, back to David. That's, that's what happened to him between Kansas city and, and today. Yeah. Oh, true road, road warriors there. I'll tell you that. <laughs> There's no way I could get my wife to ride in my car through all that. <laughs> There's a lot of wives we talk to like that. They won't get in the, they won't get in the roadster. They don't want to ride in that, but the glory loves it. And uh, there's a, there's a few who do like it, but, but uh, even Bruce Feldman, his wife doesn't like to ride in the roadster. She'll ride in the GT, but yeah, it's just, I, I don't know why. Well, you know, that day that uh, we we left Kansas City and drove north, you know, it was what ninety five degrees. Yeah. And I put my top up just to keep the sun off me. And Bob and Gloria on I twenty nine went whizzing by me with their top down, probably doing about eighty five miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, what we got to North Dakota it was still ninety eight degrees. The next day, the high was fifty seven. That's a shock to your system, I tell you. But yeah, it was a lot kind of weather uh, on, on that trip. Mostly hot though. Well, and now I know why you have your trunk outfitted the way you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's my toolbox. It's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And I, well, some of the Triumph guys are saying you must break down a lot. I said no. Those tools are for my friends that drive Triumphs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, the secret yeah. is if you if you take parts and tools with you, then you're not going to need them. Exactly. <laughs> my my battery, I mean, my uh, starter one time was intermittent. Some, so I went and bought a used starter from Team Triumph, and the starter didn't fail for the next six months because <laughs> I had this other starter in my trunk. So. Always the way. Always the way. So. Well, anyway, we're down to 9.15. Let me make another pitch. If you haven't gone to my website and clicked on the yellow PayPal button, help John afford his retirement, help John afford <laughs> pay, pay, pay Marty, um, then that's, that's uh, be very kind. Be very kind if you do. And I'll read your name next time, you know. <laughs> oh, boy. And, 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 and Marty, I enjoyed uh, the number 406. I enjoyed your interview. That was That was interesting. When I went on the latest uh, to to uh, YouTube, oh, oh, to the to our to the uh, we had the summer party Zoom stuff up there. Yeah, Not yeah, the Zoom yeah. the summer party stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. lots of people, lots of people getting interviewed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I enjoyed that. All right, well, ladies, gentlemen, it's been real kind, it's real nice tonight. So. So uh, we'll try to pick out something next time that brings some more people in from far away. Uh, I don't want to do SC carburetors again, but we'll do we'll do we'll do something that's that's exciting. So um, and if you, if you got some ideas, you can always send me a note in the mail or text me or something or other. You know, have you, you, have you done differentials yet? Nobody wants to talk about differentials. <laughs> I don't know anything about differentials. <laughs> There's nothing you can do with them. I mean, I, they're it's um they're it's, they're almost they're they're really dicey to set up, and and um you know you, so you can't go in and change bearings on them. The only thing you can do is change seals. We could talk about differentials, but but uh, and and but in the with the banjo diffs, those are handy because you can get a, a range, a range of 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 uh, speeds out of the rear end. You know, or you, you can't do that out of a out of a Salisbury tube GT diff. Well, Bruce, put the, um, but. Bruce put those uh, what are they brass discs in? Took took care of the clunk. Uh, good, and, uh, good. I don't have a clunk in my rear end or my differential. So, How about setting get, up kingpins? Where did you get the brass discs? They're not available anymore. Uh, from. Uh, <laughs> uh, the place in Denver, sports sports car, sports car craftsman. Yeah, you get some used ones. Probably uh, they were new. Really? Yeah, and and uh, what's interesting about them? They don't take credit cards. I have to shout out to them. They don't take credit cards, so they send you what you ordered with an invoice, and then you write them a check and send it back. And so we waited a couple of days to send it back. I called him up and say, "Yeah, you've heard it before, but the check's in the mail." <laughs> but but it, yeah, he's. He said that they hardly have anybody ever uh, che cheating them. So MG people are pretty decent. Yeah, that's that's really nice. I you know I asked Paul one time. I said, "Why in the world don't you take charge cards?" And he goes, three <laughs> percent." <laughs> so you know, I mean, it isn't, it isn't quite that bad when you're doing great volumes of money, but um, <laughs> but it's still. He said a percent here, a percent there. It's the difference between being in the black and being in the red. So they were very helpful, John, very nice. John, what about setting up front kingpins? Yeah, we could do that. You mean the you mean the uh the bearings, setting up bearings on a B, or you mean setting up the kingpins? The kingpins, the, the yeah, the kingpins, the with the shims and all the we can get those kits and put them in, and oh my god, that's that takes a, a little bit of doing to do, but it's, it could it would be a good explanation okay. of how it's set right or wrong. Okay, all right. I I got all the pieces. I I got I got all my uh, my boxes. I bet <laughs> I bet and a lot of experience. I'll bet with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I just I just um, there's a fellow Daniel Harrison uh, who um, who was working on an MGA. I ran into him at Solvang. That was 2017, I think, in California. And he was, I think he's still a teenager, and he's much older than that now, 23, 24, something or other. And uh, he got his MGA all done. And and damn, if, if the V 
video didn't go around of Jay Leno driving his MGA. You know, that that's that's pretty cool stuff. So anyway, he, he called me, I don't know, last week or something or other. He goes, how in the world did you change a kingpin on an MGA? And so I went through on, on how to do it. And he, he when he was successful and did it, he told me that, that was the most difficult thing he'd ever done on his car is changing the kingpin on an MGA. Because you got to press the, uh, the old kingpin out and the new kingpin in. So it, it's a, you need a great big press. So anyway, MG are you talking about, um, geez, I can't think of his name now, but, uh, Daniel, Daniel, I, I mean, was Daniel Harrison. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I follow his YouTube channel. He's now been working also on a uh, T type on TC. And, uh, TC. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Interesting kid. And this is great because no, he's a young this man. Is so uh, this is somebody we need to follow. He, he's a young guy that wants to work on MGs. Yeah, his parents are British. He may have been born in England, maybe, but he's got a British accent. I said, "Why? You know, I mean, you're from California, dude. How come you, you don't have a Valley Girl accent or something?" And he just he picked up the accent at home, I guess. But yeah, he he you'd think he was you'd think he was born and raised in England, but no. Anyway, yeah, okay. you mentioned uh, you mentioned Jay Leno. Yeah, a number of years ago, when he used to do the man in the street interviews in parking lots, and he was talking to a woman with an MGB GT, and he said, "That's one of my favorite cars." Uh, uh, that stuck with me. So when I had my shop on Patterson Avenue, that was that was he was a return from the Tonight Show, and I sent a letter. I don't know where I came up with his address. I said, dear, dear Mr. Leno, I understand you found yourself unemployed and we're desperate for mechanics. That's where he started working on British cars. I said, so there's always a, always a job waiting for you here at University Motors. I, I didn't get the satisfaction of a response. Maybe I sent it to the wrong address or maybe he never saw it or maybe he gets a thousand of those a day. So anyway, <laughs> yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. He started off with British cars. Ladies. How about some maybe maybe on the accessories? You know, talking about uh, accessories for MGs. Oh, that'd be interesting. I'm I, behind you right now. You got the lights on the car there. I uh, yeah, I um, I had a customer who passed away, and he had a relatively complete collection of road and track magazine. And I swore that I was going to go through the back of every road and track and find every MG ad I could. I mean, back in the heyday types and MGAs and stuff because people were making stuff in their basement and in their shop and everything that were just sort of one-off little things but a lot of cool a lot of cool accessories yeah so yeah all right accessories and king and the kingpins sure that's cool I have a whole section on my website for accessories all neat stuff yeah I, and I, you know I've got a guy here in town Art Lewis I was gonna but before COVID, or did I start these before COVID? Um, I talked to him. He's he's collected car badges, and he's got hundreds of MG car badges um, from clubs from all over. I, I'll I'll talk to him too. That that's sort of a ancillary to to the. Uh, I'm gonna talk to him soon because he takes his winters in, in Florida. Those are good ideas. Thank you very much. Well, hey, it's it's uh, about not, uh, 25 past nine. So thank you very kindly for everybody for being on tonight. Don't forget to press the PayPal button. And uh, thanks, thanks for coming on. Uh, Fred Horner, thanks for your comments. Barney, thanks for yours. Um, and uh, Chris Plank, nice to see you. Thanks for coming to the party. So, yeah. Thank you, John. Good. Yeah. Thank you, John. Good night, John. Thank you very much. Ron Thanks, John. Good night. Ron Good night. Good night. Thanks, John. Two weeks, Good night, Ron. John. Out there. Yeah. Hey, thank you. See you tomorrow. Yeah, Robert. See you then. Two right, well, weeks. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Two weeks from tonight, right?
Oh, yeah, sure. I always say that, but I didn't say it tonight. So that's uh, 14, and uh, so that must be about the 23rd then, huh? So, yes. Yep. So. We'll see yep. you then. All right. Hate to give up. Such a nice group to commune with. <laughs> right. Thank you very yeah. much. See everybody. Everybody have, thanks, John. Everybody have a good night. Thank you.